Welcome to your Digital Mentor Podcast. I'm Alice Matimba from Welcome Connecting Science, and I'll be your host. And I'm Alel Pong, also your co-host from Manchester. So today we'll have a conversation about research publishing. So we all know that publishing is the currency for research. It gets people promoted, it gets people jobs, and obviously impacts quite significantly on people's careers. So today we'll talk about how to publish, discuss some of the, you know, tricks and twists around publishing, and of course, some of the topical issues around publishing. So stay tuned. Um, so our guests are Seye and Oli, and I will now ask them to introduce themselves. I am Seye Bimbala. I am an academic at the University of Sydney in Australia, where I study health systems and study epistemic issues in global health. I'm also the current Prince Klaus Chair in Equity and Development at Utrecht University and the Editor-in-Chief of BMJ Global Health. Thank you. And Oli? Hello, I'm Orly Bacall. I'm currently Editor-in-Chief of Cell Genomics, a new journal at Cell Press that is focused on the forefront of genetics, genomics and technology. And it's unique in the field for being the first premier journal that's both open access and open science, which is something I'm very excited about. I've been an editor now nearly two decades. I started at Nature Genetics, Nature Reviews Genetics, and then was the genomics editor of Nature until I moved to Cell Press this past year. And before then, my background, my academic background was in genomics and epidemiology. Wow, thank you. Yes, so being an editor, what's it like to be an editor? What is it all that? I mean, <laughs> obviously editors are like these big gods that, you know, accept or don't accept people's <laughs> publications. So, so, I mean, I'm just curious to know, how did you get into, um, into publishing? Um, is it something that, you know, you had special skills? Did you train for it? Um, how, how, how did you end up becoming, uh, going into publishing? Orly? So for me, I, I came in a somewhat unusual path. Um, so I'll tell you first how I came to this. I grew up in an academic family. My parents are both professors at Princeton in astrophysics. My brothers are, are both PhDs in state and science. And I grew up knowing that I was going to be a scientist. I love the scientific method. I love the scientific exploration. I also love the academic lifestyle that I grew up in. So I really always envision that life for myself as well. And I still love a lot of that lifestyle, but what happened for me is I, I went to undergraduate at MIT and became very uh, engaged with academic work in genomics and decided that's what I was going to pursue in, in my PhD. But then I ended up going to England for a Marshall Scholarship and decided I was going to study for a brief period some of my other loves in political science because I really believed that all scientists should be really informed about policy and, and the top policy making that happens in our country should be informed by the top scientists. So I was going to study at Oxford policy and then come back and do my PhD. Instead, I got very interested while I was there in mathematical modeling of epidemics because there was really interesting and really impressive groups there. And the groups are still leading the current efforts right now for modeling the epidemics, uh, modeling the pandemic, and informing government strategies around that. So I really enjoyed that as, as a change. And then when I was looking to go to my postdoc, I was again looking to go back into genomics and statistical genetics, uh, but applied more broadly than to try to figure out really what was the next step and what was the best thing I was looking to do. And while I I looked at sort of my strategy for what I was doing in that search, you know, some of it was around really specific questions I wanted to answer in my career. And, you know, I'd mapped out several decades of my academic career, but most of what ended up being on my strategy search for that was about the skills development that I needed for that. And I started realizing what I gained from graduate school. While I learned a lot about really important work and it was really interesting to be able to model epidemics and it was very important and I wanted to get involved more in public health. You know, I felt like I was still underdeveloped in a lot of areas that would be really important in my academic career. And I was trying to figure out where I, can I get that sort of skills development. So I applied more broadly at things that were interesting and that's how I came upon this editor job because uh, while I was preparing for postdoc interviews, I was reading all the papers in Nature Genetics, which published all the top papers in the field. And um, 
saw an ad for an assistant editor in Agent Genetics. So I applied for that really without knowing what an editor did or what the job entailed. Even though I came from an academic family, I'd never met an editor or heard much about them because in astrophysics, publishing in academic journals is not the most important things. Uh, communications happens through preprints and discussions directly between scientists, which is something I still believe in strongly. So really, I, the first time I heard about this was when I met with my to be chief editor and he explained to me what the work was like. And I was just enamored by it. I couldn't believe that this was a real job. I was blown away and, and, you know, understand I was coming from being a graduate student, which is a struggle. It is always a struggle. It's, it's a long haul to do a small question. And here as an editor, I have the very best work in my field on my desk every morning. I have access to all scientists everywhere. I love learning about the science. I love working with all scientists everywhere, at all places, at all levels. I love working with scientists, learning wow. about their science and helping them develop it to the top standards. And that's what wow. we're able to do as scientists. And once I heard that, I really was just blown away that I'd never even heard this was a career path. So I <laughs> had this very, very set, you know, next three decades of my life path mapped out for myself very sure of it. And yeah. I went into that interview and came out being like, well, this is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And I still was a bit, you know, very attached to that career path. So it was actually difficult for me. When I had my first job offer, I went back to my chief editor and said, I'm, I'm unsure. I'm not ready to give up on my academic path because I spent my whole life at that time <laughs> preparing for it. So what I asked him was that, can I do maybe two years as an alternate postdoc to have this training? Because when I look back at what my strategy was for the search was really to get that training development. And what was amazing is really almost everything on my list of, of personal and professional training that I was looking for were something I was going to get as being an editor. Well, yeah, it seems like you've really, really enjoying yourself. And I think, um, you know, you're in the right place, which is great. And like you said, you know, we all sometimes, I mean, I feel the same way that I feel like I never really planned for this career path and it's just exactly what I'm doing and I'm enjoying it. And Sheha, you have the best of both worlds, actually. You're an academic and you're also editor-in-chief of a very big journal. Yes, I feel as though my, my path was a bit more predictable. As a medical student, the big medical schools in Nigeria have student-run academic journals. And okay. I joined the editorial board of that journal in my third of six years in medical school. So it's a kind of thing where you sort of get into kind of prestigious kind of little thing. But what it did was also open my eyes to the broader global publishing landscape. So I started to write for the student BMJ, I think in my year four. And in my final year, I won something called the BMJ Clegg Scholarship, where they get medical students from around the world to come and spend two months at the BMJ offices in London and pretty much learn how to put a journal together. So I went as a final year medical student into the offices of the BMJ, and I, I was completely enamored by, by the entire machinery of, of journal production. It was designed such that you didn't necessarily have a task. You just picked on what interested you. Um, you sat on what's called the hanging committee. And that hanging committee sounds like, like something very macabre, you know. But, but it's, it's a word from, uh, I think it's the London or British Gallery, um, who decides which painting gets hung on, on the wall. So, so it was the meeting where editors made the final decision at the end of, on Thursday every week, which papers got published in the next week's edition of the journal. So, so again, sitting there, just having a good sense of how decisions are made, how journals are put together, how articles are written, especially non-research articles, how journalists within the BMJ worked as well. So just that entire environment got me really interested in academic publishing. But then I finished medical school, I went into public health, did a master's, did a PhD, well, was doing a PhD when the BMJ, my, my boss, my supervisor, when I was at the BMJ as a clerk scholar, reached out to me and said, you know, we're thinking of having a global health journal. Um, I, and I hadn't figured out that this was almost an interview. <laughs> um, can you tell us what, what it should look like? So I sort of 
of course, I've, I've been encouraging the BMJ to have a Global Health Journal for, for a long time because I felt that they could develop, there was a huge space in the field for, for such a journal. And then I sort of supplied what I, my thoughts were, and I had lots of thoughts about what a Global Health Journal should be, and, and, and I, I have strong feelings about what was lacking in the field. And a few months down the line, I was asked, will you want to be the editor-in-chief? And I was, I was in the second year of my PhD. And I said, of course, of course. But that meant I had to finish my PhD very quickly. So I finished my PhD in sort of four months. Like I had to wrap it up and, and get to this thing. Um, but also I, I combined that with, with a full-time role as an academic, which has its own benefits as well, because I think it allows me to see and understand what academics want, their fears and, in, and insecurities, uh, and, and their challenges and concerns about how publishing works on the other side. But, but I think the, the most important thing to mention before I stop is that working at the BMJ at such an early stage in my career, I was even really essentially a student, meant that I lost my respect for academic publishing in a sense. I, I haven't seen how the, the sausage is made. I, I no longer have had huge regard for it. And I think that this respect has served me well in my career as an academic, but also as an editor. We'll probably delve more into that maybe later down the line. This podcast is for like people who are up and coming in their profession. So if a researcher were to sort of decide on uh, publishing their work as uh, editors-in-chief, like how do they go about sort of selecting a journal? And maybe if you can uh, elaborate on sort of challenges they should sort of maybe expect or things they should be watching out for pitfalls and like stuff like uh, plagiarism, soft plagiarism, um, as people who sort of review and other such, maybe you have like some insight that um, our audience could get some information on. Sure, that's a great question. So I think one of the most important things to do, uh, particularly for younger scientists when they're new to publishing, is to really try to start off when you have a manuscript that you're getting ready, start off by thinking about what you're trying to accomplish with this publication, because you always have a list of things that you're trying to accomplish, uh, both for your professional growth and for the field about what you're trying to communicate about your oath of work. So it's real, I find it's really helpful to just write that down. You know, I'm very big into defining my strategy, write down what are your goals and review this with your advisor saying, I need this publication to, because I'm up for this grant, I'm up for this job search, I'm up for this, and we're looking for this. And then very important part of that strategy is where you want to communicate. You can say, we've done this work, there's a new technology, we want it to be adopted by the genomics field, or we want it to be adopted in clinical practice. Those are two different things. And it's important that you then gear where you want your paper to be seen by approaching a journal which has that readership. And then um, maybe share if you could tell us a bit about some challenges or some pitfalls that people who are writing and developing their manuscripts should look out for, including sort of those related to publishing and the whole process. So I often think of, of academic writing and, and even research as a conversation or, or an argument, a really long argument. Every bit of paper contributes something to that. And if you want to target a journal, try and find a journal where that conversation is being had in your field and target that. That, that, that. that is, I think, one of the most important considerations in choosing a journal and in getting past the first, that first screening stage with an editor. Because an editor also knows the conversations that they are trying to curate, right? They, they know what it is they are trying to, to assemble. So, so that, that is one, one important thing about publishing. Know, know where the conversation you are trying to be part of is being had and get yourself in there. The second thing is ticking all the boxes, making sure that all the rules are fulfilled. What goes in introduction goes there. What goes in methods goes there appropriately, etc. cetera. So make sure that you tick all those boxes. Because as, as an editor, one of the things that you, one of the ways in which you look at a paper is with a, with a healthy dose of skepticism, does this person know what they're doing? Do, do they know what they're saying? And you want to convince immediately, just by quick scanning through your paper, the editor, that, that, that indeed, you, you, you know what you're doing, you know, you know what you're saying, you're serious, you've checked all the journal's you know, expectations. I think it's, we're moving towards a place where journals are a bit more relaxed with the first submission about ticking all the boxes with their own the idiosyncrasies. But you want to make sure that at least within the scientific field in which you're operating, you, you've fulfilled all the, all the 
criteria. Now, you mentioned plagiarism or self-plagiarism. Again, it, the, the, the key thing here is, as you write, that, that you are very alive to the possibility that you are not citing appropriately or, or that you are lifting phrases, because these things are very easy. They are, I was raised in a Christian home, so I, Bible verses jump into my head all the time. Um, they are sins that easily beset us. It's, it's a line, I think, from Paul. So, so th these are very sort of ready, readily available scenes that you have to be conscious of all the time and uh, avoid. Don't copy and paste into your paper. Read and, and interpret and write kind of thing. If a journal wants a letter to the editor, write a letter to the editor. It's often not very important, but if a journal wants it, do it. Because the editor may go to it to make a final decision about whether to send your paper to peer review or not. Um, so, so again, fulfill all the, all the criteria. Wow, that's a very nice brief. I wish I had known that before I started trying to write papers when I was doing my PhD. So um, I'm going to ask you each a question about authorship. The first question is to Oli. So first, what is authorship? And secondly, what are your thoughts around putting people's names on papers, like big names, because then they'll get, you know, this increases the chance of them getting published in that kind of or practice that we know is happening a lot of the times which may be good or bad, but I just want to hear what your thoughts are on that. I think that's a great question. And it's, it's a very important and a very important issue in, in the broader scientific field and something that's really changing uh, what it means to be an author of a scientific paper has changed quite a bit over the past couple of decades. Uh, we are seeing a vast increase in the number of papers in individual publications. And some of that is for good reason. So I'll just sort of separate that. The parts that are very good reasons and the part that is an editor I very much want to support is because the nature of how we do science has shifted and in important ways in that we are increasingly becoming more collaborative internationally across every border, academic, industry, countries. You know, we need to cross all borders and disciplines to be able to do the sort of work that we need to do to really transform science, to transform medicine. We've seen that this past year with the pandemic as the perfect example. And we're seeing this at all levels of science. Uh, and that's something that's incredibly important. And that's one way I think is very important for us as editors and publishers to support our scientists is be able to, to do what we can to support the changing system of authorship. So because a lot of papers will very rightly need to have much larger author lists because they are large international co collaborations, mm -hmm. We need to support that and we need to make sure that everyone has the right attributions and credit. Because one of the big challenges that these collaborations have is that there can be several hundred thousand or more authors and people who, who spent a couple of years on that work may not get senior or first author positions on it that they need for their career advancement. We need to find ways to acknowledge the really important work that they did which is completely valid and is very important and shows what a wonderful scientist they are and that they deserve the career advancement. But if, if they are not given that kind of encouragement, there will be continuing disincentive for them to be team scientists, right? And then we wouldn't have people stepping up to help fight the pandemic the way we've seen in the past year. If everyone was focused on their personal academic progression, mm -hmm. we would not have seen the response that we did. Uh, so we are working in ways to give individual authors and team scientists the kind of recognition and credit that they deserve in these big author papers. That's great. I guess a lot of changes. It's a time of change. And I think it's good that, you know, publishers are also seeing how to support the changes and the big authorship papers that are out there. And, you know, my, my question about authorship to share is about uh, something just I read recently, actually, I think it maybe two weeks ago. So your journal, BMJ Global Health, um, is famous for publishing all sorts of really topical, contentious issues. <laughs> the recent one is the one on authorship parasitism by Chris Rees, uh, I think, with where Global North, where authors who are based in Global North who publish on activities or research in Global South, but do not include anyone from the Global South. Is this something you feel is a real concern and how can it be addressed? Yes, it is a real concern. 
But I think it's a real concern uh, in, two, in two ways that I think are very important. The first is that it is an equity concern that it is possible to go into a country and do research and get out and publish without crediting anyone in the country or without involving anyone in the country or, or with very minimal involvement and credit to people in the country. The second concern is an interpretive one, which is that it is very likely that if you go into a country and you conduct research without involving anyone in, in any substantial way, that you will come out with mistaken analysis or wrong interpretations of what you thought you found. So, so there are two sets of concerns here. One, one is absolutely scientific in terms of interpretation of, of your analysis on what you found. The other is just being a decent human being uh, and being respectful. <laughs> um, and I think this, these two are, are important um, concerns that, that require action from journals, but also from universities and from funders. Because I think part of this is the norms that govern scientific publishing or, or, or academic life broadly, that there are in many ways these norms, as Oli was talking about, you know, that, that there are so the places where you want to have your name on, on the paper or the ways in which you are promoted at an at institution that sometimes are an obstacle to being a decent human being. And I think the, the task here is, of course, there is the agency of the individual in, in trying to make the most of a difficult situation, but there's also the structure that constrains people to do, you know, bad things. And, and we have to focus on action at all those stages. How do universities set their promotion criteria for a field? Should it be such that they actually incentivize academics to be collaborative, to recognize others, to work in teams, to share first authorship or to share credit in, in, in particular ways? We could also focus on funders. Um, you know, how do funders themselves incentivize the system? Th there was 30, 40 years ago, a huge shift in animal research, right? um, the, the ways in which animals are used in research. And one of the people who, one of the entities that were involved in that was, was funders. We, we don't want to be seen funding these things that are problematic. So, you know, we also have to find a way of making funders completely averse to funding work that is parachute research, like, oh, that's inequitable in any way. Universities fund that, individual researchers, and especially journals. Journals, I think, collectively have a huge role to play. How do they allow, for example, multiple first authorship, multiple last authorship? How do they collectively, for example, say we won't publish your work if, it's, if it has any hint of parachute research? You know, action at all these levels can change the ecosystem and change the norms. It, it's a question of norms for the most part. And, you know, I, I believe that this can change and they've changed in the past. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Shay, it provides sort of a perfect segue into our next question, which is um, sort of barriers facing um, sort of authors. Oh, <laughs> Arlie, yes. Um, you wanted to add something? Yes, please. Because that's such a wonderful topic and you you expressed mm -hmm. um, that so eloquently. And I think I was really, I agree with, with everything you said. I just want to add, I think, for, you know, this notion of helicopter research is something that's super important uh, across the scientific field and something we're all very passionate about. You know, we work really hard to see what we can do to address that. The important thing to remember is that by the time it gets to my desk as a first submission of a publication to a journal, it's really too late. What I can do is reject the paper because I think it's inappropriate. And, and I will, and I will tell the authors this is inappropriate. But by the time they've written up a manuscript, it's too late and it's inappropriate mm -hmm. for them to submit a manuscript without really engaging all the people mm -hmm. and populations where the research was based. And so what we really promote and we're trying to work for is making sure that everyone understands they need to address this from the very beginning of the study, saying who is involved, where is this research done, how can we get them involved from the very beginning of our study before we even start any analysis. And then it'll be second nature by the time you're ready to write up a paper. Of course, their authors, they've been working with you for several years on this. And so really that's what we're trying to promote. And you're right, funders have a strong role in this, but really mm -hmm. it's pushing to make sure that everyone understands this is essential to do at the time you're starting, when you're first reaching out to get samples, when you're first reaching out to start collaboration, that's when you have that conversation. Yeah, definitely sort of like 
they get to the roots before the symptoms sort of like you know yeah if a researcher is working on a manuscript there are a lot of barriers that they face not just sort of after the funding has come in and you're working on it um limitations associated with uh, language sort of publishing in english um limitations with time writing skills being a female in the publication space so um, what advice can you give to researchers who may face some of um, these barriers as sort of people who review their manuscripts and yeah do you have any advice for them or even sharing your thoughts about all of this maybe you have a, an insight that you could um, learn from yeah so so, so th th this th there's a lot going on here the problem of language and the the elitism that, that comes with with academic the academic life itself it's it's a I often say to my fellow academics that, that you may not know it, but, but you have a lot of power and a lot of privilege just, just by being in this space. Now, it, it wouldn't often appear so because of, you know, everyone has people who are above them and who, on, on whom they focus. Like, oh, these people have power above me. But, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, we, we are extremely privileged, powerful people. And, and that means that, that naturally that there are barriers into entering our ranks, uh, and one of them is, you know, uh, uh, language. I, I know that that uh, especially in in the US, academics often talk about being first generation academic, which of course is that you that there are those things that you don't know. Um, that there are ways that you're not aware that you should frame something or write something or say something. That there are doors you're not aware you could knock and they would open to you. Um, so there are all these barriers, so even outside of language as English, but just language as code. And then there's language as English, which is a huge issue, especially for people from non-English speaking backgrounds. Now, if, if you find yourself in that kind of situation, as, as many of us do, it may be possible to, to be in a team that has, you know, uh, language support. I, I have a group who submit to BMJ Global Health often enough, uh, and I know because I've edited their work, um, their team has, uh, someone they consult and they pay. Even having that is, is a class of privilege by itself um, that, that many people don't have access to. But if you do have access to it, or if you can have access to it, if you can write that into your grant application, if you can negotiate that with your supervisor, it's, it's worth doing. The, the other thing is that, that that in itself is a process of learning. Um, you you, you de also get, then get to learn what it looks like so that you don't need that always or all the time or forever. There's very little journals can do, um, apart from some journals that sort of have in-house or, or a business on the side where, where there, there's sort of English language editing, etc. kind of service. Some journals have that. But again, that is costly. It costs you something. It's, these things are not cheap or free. So it, it is a barrier. It's a barrier that I'm not sure I know exactly how to get around. But, but it's important to recognize the role it plays in, in our ecosystem. I'm curious about the publication fees as a barrier and wonder what Orly thinks about. <laughs> Maybe we'll come back to that, but I think it's also part of the barriers that um, people face. Yes, it, absolutely. I think that's a really important one, particularly as we're talking about the growth of open access and publications and how important it is. We both have open access journals and that's something I'm very passionate about <laughs> that the research that we're publishing is so important and fundamental for transforming our society, transforming medicine, that it's really, uh, at this time, it's just not appropriate for that to be behind a publication barrier. And that means it's just switching the business model because these are publishers are businesses. It's switching that from you pay for libraries paying for subscription, which is how it's traditionally done, to an author pays a fee. So either way, someone needs to pay for the work that goes through in making this happen, just as you would uh, for newspaper. Uh, but that is a barrier for a lot of authors. And as a publisher, we do recognize that and we try to work to make sure that every author is able to work with that. So anyone who's from an, uh, a place where they don't have grant support for the article charges, we work to waive that or find them other ways to, to provide support from other, whether it's a funder or a foundation who may be able to help them support it. So we want to make sure that everyone is able to do that. And we do that blinded so that it has absolutely no influence on our decision of whether we publish it. I don't need to know. It's really going to be done at another level of how can we get you the support you need to make sure this is published open access and it is supported by your grants. You know, yesterday I was reading this the article about the 
long history of commercial publishing <laughs> and the sort of like big publishers, big profits. But I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's again, one of those topics that's, uh, that's, it's quite interesting. So, you know, because it, it does concern a lot of researchers, particularly even, even researchers who are in say high income countries and they, you know, they're trying to access articles and they cost a lot of money. It's not part of the institution and so forth. And I think Ella had a perfect example because she's doing uh, some research and she's... Yeah, I, I just recently sort of worked with a team to publish an article and it was quite interesting that even getting, because as scientists, our work is to like, you know, we are curious, we want to answer questions and we hope that sort of the responses that we get would then reach not just the science community or the scientific community but those outside you know people who might benefit from it and as scientists you first sort of have to you know work on your work spend a lot of time then after that to get your work to the external community you have to pay for it if it's open access or if uh, and if they're journal is subscription based and maybe and like how long there's so many sort of like conditions that sort of come with that then even still with that, if later, if you're a scientist and you want to get work and maybe you're not affiliated to a university or university, your university does not have access to a particular journal, then you still have to pay for it. So like, where is it? And even people, regular people, if they want to access it, how are they going to access it if you're not subscribed to a particular journal or it's not open access? Like, what is it? And there's a lot of research that shows that publication, uh, like big journals actually get a lot of profit because we have sort of peer review that is on a voluntary basis. So then... What is the in between? What gap are we missing as scientists that maybe it's not visible? Like, what are we missing that maybe <laughs> you all can elaborate on and maybe share also some advice on sort of this whole process? I think uh, I, as young scientists, we would really appreciate it to learn more about this whole process. In global health, there, there is, um, in, in the last few years, there, there, there's a framing of a group of things called the commercial determinants of health. And in that framing, we are often thinking about big food, big pharma. We're thinking about alcohol industry, tobacco, etc. We are thinking about those kinds of products. And I've just, before joining you this morning, I just finished um, writing a, a very short blog in which I, I suggested that the academic publishing industry might be considered a commercial determinant. And I say that because one of the very brilliant things about big business is, is that they manage to be invisible. Their power manages to be invisible. And it's very true of, of academic publishing as well. That when you think about the entire ecosystem of, of academic publishing, it's extremely extractive, both in terms of just money and also in terms of knowledge and in terms of geography. So in terms of money, as you said, a lot, the industry takes money from the free labor of a lot of actors in the ecosystem and, and concentrated. In terms of knowledge, very often, this knowledge get, then gets sort of sequestered in a place where you have to pay to, to access it. And in terms of geography, these journals are pretty much very, very global north. Right? So they, they are high-income country journals. And in, in many ways, they manage to so design the structure that they so gatekeep entry into academic publishing. That is very difficult for people trying to build and found new journals, especially in LMIs, is to do so successfully. Now, I, I, I did not appreciate how difficult it is to start a new journal, and I'm sure Oli has a lot of experience here, um, <laughs> until BMJ Global Health went through its sort of early phases, and I realized that if a bunch of academics in Nigeria wanted to start a new journal, they will almost certainly fail, because there's this huge back-end infrastructure that allows it to work. And that infrastructure is tied again to this humongous thing. In many ways, we, we have to find a way to talk about this in the open more and more stridently. And we also have to collectively, because I, I believe very strongly that, that we are all participants in, in this ecosystem, myself included. Yeah. And, and we can also choose to not be participants over time if we can act co collectively. You know, I, I really wish if I was talking to a big funder and, and they want to ask me how to support the academic industry or ecosystem in LMICs, I say provide resources to start new journals and get those journals to a place where they can be quickly and readily recognized, just like BMG Global Health was. The journal is less than six years old. Now, imagine the possibility of having the infrastructure to start a journal like BMJ Global Health, you know, on public health, 
two, three of them on the continent. It changes everything. And I don't think people appreciate enough how much change lowering the, the, the entry barriers could, could affect in, in, in the ecosystem with, with a lot of support. So, so I, I do honestly strongly believe that, that we can't, it, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to change what the Lancet does or what the DMG does or what Elsevier does or, or what Wiley does. What we can change is ensuring that there are other players in that, in that ecosystem. Just like PLUS did, you know, years ago, about two decades ago now, when they started the open access movement, it changed, it changed the entire ecosystem. Other journals wouldn't have started it unless there was a new journal doing something new. And I believe that if we want to change the ecosystem, we have to find a way of lowering the entry barrier, so at least facilitating entry for journals that want to do things differently. Yeah, your voice really resonated because I read exactly that same statement by a Bangladeshi researcher who talked about how sort of reputable, like if you talk about um, journals that are... High impact? In, yeah, like fake journals. Predatory journals. Predatory and sort of because there's sort of this high expectation and there's not a lot of access of journals within the global south, they all have to sort of try to reach sort of these reputable journals and um, just sort of pressure in the ac academics of like getting tenure and promotion and sort of all of that and trying to sort of reach a place where there's these high expectations still as money. And um, he proposed exactly what you're saying, sort of invest in the global south with establishing of um, not only sort of journals, but also ones that sort of have um, high standards so that then their names are also recognized and we could also, people from the global south could also then publish their work and also have to struggle to um, reach these reputable journals. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, so cell genomics, uh, Oli, what is the impact factor? We just started publishing a month ago. An impact factor <laughs> takes a couple years. But also, I think it's a really good that you asked that question. So I'll just say impact factor is now what we consider as the only or the important metric in, in a journal. Yeah. Uh, and it's really mm -hmm. unfortunate that too much of the community is focused on that. We really yeah. believe that the true impact of a science journal is what we do for our scientific community, the services we provide our community, how we support our scientists, our authors, our readers, how we help to actually promote the advancement of science and the effective communication. That's where we draw impact and value. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always been a bit, not, not, not really skeptical, but I've always struggled with the whole idea of impact factor and how it's so important. And it is important, but I think what's important is, can we get our work out there? Does it, you know, is it reviewed, properly reviewed? Is it making uh, an impact? So I've never been a big fan of sort of like targeting high impact journals, but then again, maybe that's why I'm not in, you know, research anymore. <laughs> Yeah, so I might be just a, a failure in the process. But anyway, you know, there's another elephant, big elephant in the room, which is the predatory journals. Why are there so many? There's so many of them. And how do you, how does one spot them and avoid them? I, I think the first thing to say is that we live in a capitalist world and there's nothing we can do about that right now or perhaps forever. And in, in, in a capitalist world, something emerges to supply what is demanded. In other words, entities fill a gap in the market. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves, and the question I ask myself a lot, is what role does the dominant academic publishing industry play in creating an ecosystem that allows these entities called predatory journals to flourish? Because they are, they are a feature of exclusion. They merge to fill a gap by people, for people who have been excluded from the system. Now, I, I completely take it that they are, you know, it's bad, right? And, and its practices are bad, but, but I'm not willing to just stop there. We created a situation that made that even possible in the first place. And we, as I discussed earlier, we have to recognize our role in, 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 in fostering that ecosystem. That said, if you want to avoid predatory journals, a few pointers. Again, I recognize how deeply problematic even these pointers are. Right? <laughs> if, a few pointers um, will include, are they in the recognized databases? For example, so if you want to submit to a journal, ch check if it's which database it's on. Again, getting into a database, it's, it's a way of gatekeeping itself. Uh, and that's 
emerging literature to show that that if if you're going to get into PubMed, for example, you you need a lot of resources behind you to make that happen. It just doesn't happen because you, you are publishing, right? Um, so so even getting there itself is is a gatekeeping point and strategy that have been exploited by dominant players in the industry to keep people out. And even the label predatory, sorry, I keep going back to this, even the label predatory has been exploited by publishers, big publishers, to, to make sure that they get, keep smaller publishers from getting in. So of course, be aware, of course, run away from publishing your work in predatory journals, but, but do so completely aware that, that you are playing in a system that has been rigged in a particular way. And that the existence of these journals itself is, 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 a, is a manifestation of, of that messed up state of affairs. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And Orly, do you have anything else to add on that? You know, I really agree that um, just the whole publishing industry is really in a time of change. And that transition that we're in is really important. It's a time for us to evaluate what we're really about, what kind of services we're providing to the scientific community. And like I said, I'm really here to help provide top services to our academics, uh, to not just academics, to scientists everywhere across any borders to help progress science and transform medicine. And I think that's what we need to focus on as publishers. And to do that, we are changing and transforming the whole industry, and that's important. I do think we'll continue to see these really important changes. These past uh, few years, past five years, we've seen really important changes in open access and open science publishing, which I've been involved with, which is why I'm now able to launch an open access, open science journal, which I would not have been able to do years ago. And that's really one of the important changes, but I think we're going to continue to see really important shifts over the next decade of how we publish and, and what the industry looks like. And, and yeah. ju just, sorry, just in a futuristic mode, I, I allow myself to imagine that the current way in which you will think about scientific communication to so write a paper with this structure is extremely old. You know, if, even the idea of a journal has survived for far too long. I mean, this, this thing has existed for, you know, a couple more centuries. It's one of those few things that have refused to change. And, and I think the transition from paper to online was a huge step. I still feel as though the academic publishing industry didn't make the most of it in terms of just transition in how it sees itself. And I hope that, that further advances in technology will help the, the field get to a different place. I really love what Oli said uh, at the beginning, that astrophysicists do not think of journals as the primary mode of communication so much. And I wonder what, what a world of scientific communication that does not center journals look like. And, and I think that world is possible, if not inevitable. Well, thank you. I think uh, we're almost um, rounding up with a just one last question. And this is directed to say, so you and others just recently published on promoting equitable authorship and research. And can you tell us just briefly why, why it's important at this juncture to have such a guideline? What change do you envision? And, and, and in fact, so what, what would be your measure of success? So what would you be looking to, to, to achieve uh, and by when? This was um, work that um, I did with a group of journal editors um, and researchers, especially researchers from the Global South. And all of us had the same concern that, that Oli has also expressed about parachute research. And we felt that we can keep complaining um, or we can get together, sit down and, and do something. So this was an effort to go beyond just saying this is a problem and saying what, what, what would change look like and what mechanisms would be necessary. So we convened several workshops and meetings where we sort of discussed and debated what, what change might look like. And one of the ideas that came from that was to make a series of recommendations to journals. Um, and I mentioned some of them earlier, sort of make the list of authors limitless, make it possible to have multiple first authors, multiple last authors, et cetera. But also we recommended a reflexivity statement, especially for research from um, partnerships between high income countries and LMACs. Um, and, and this statement essentially asks of authors submitting manuscripts from such partnerships to, to describe briefly 
what went down in the partnership? You know, how, how was the research question decided? How was the method decided? How was local leadership taken into account in, in, the, in the work, but also in, in, in the article itself? How were issues of equity, whether it's early career researchers or women or other disadvantaged groups taken into account in the, in the putting together of the work and the manuscript? So a series of questions. And, and the goal, as, as Oli said earlier, at the point of submission, is, it's already too late. But if you know that, that you're going to have to talk about that at the point of submission, it changes your behavior. So, so, so the, the goal is not so much to change you at the point of submission, it's to change you before you get there, because you know that you anticipate it. This was one of the ways in which ethics requirements were, became a norm, because you know that the journal will be afraid to publish your work without ethics clearance. So, so, so there are examples in, in the research ecosystem that show that if, if someone is waiting for you at the, at the point of publication, you, you are likely to change your behavior. Now, how do you measure this? I don't know. I suspect that, that perhaps in a few years down the line, we're hoping that more and more journals adopt this, or at least see it as the norm to, as the norm to ask questions about authorship. And again, just asking these questions changes behavior. And also I've noticed increasingly, another, another editor has said this to me, that reviewers are beginning to pick up on potential parachute research in their review comments to the authors or, or, or confidentially to the editor. Again, for me, these are signs that the ecosystem itself is changing in terms of its norms. This, this is how norms, I, I keep talking about norms, this is how norms change. I can't police a partnership, no one can police a partnership who is outside of it. But, but, but the norms can change in such a way that it doesn't even need policing at all. And, and I think that if, if there's success, if there's a mark of success, it is to see these norms shift in the field. And, and you can only observe that by changing behavior either of authors, of funders, of individual researchers, um, of journals. So, so that, that for me, that, that's the goal. The goal is to shift the norms and, and to observe that in, in how behaviors change. Thank you. Oli, do you have anything else to add to that? I agree. I think that was beautifully eloquently said. I think we're, we're really all focused on working at that early stage to see what we can do to ensure that everyone is involved equally and equitably in the research and that everyone equitably is able to benefit from the products of the research as well. Yeah. Well, well, this has been a very exciting discussion. So we've almost reaching the end of our discussion. Before we uh, wrap up, um, I just want to hear from you if you have maybe just one message to our audiences, just a few words that uh, you'd like to to share with our audiences one tip perhaps, or just one wise, you know, some wise words for our audiences. We'll start with Che. Yeah, I, I think because this, this uh, audience, an audience of, I think, primarily sort of youngish academics, I, I think um, I'll go back to where I started, that, that a healthy dose of disrespect for, for, the, for the process it is, could be very useful. Just knowing that you could push that you could make demands, that you could say things the way you see it. Um, and, and knowing that editors are human beings, you know, reviewers are human beings and, and they, they get convinced by argument, um, by also by, you know, strong positions. Uh, it could be very useful just broadly in your career as it starts, but also in, into the future. Ha having a bit of confidence and, and a bit of, of, you know, healthy disrespect is useful. Interesting. <laughs> and from you, Oli, any, well, a few wise words. <laughs> So I'd say I, I always encourage uh, young scientists, any scientist really to understand, I just like to say that editors are here to help and work with scientists. Uh, I would encourage them to reach out to the editors of any journals that you're approaching. We try to be as available as we can. In normal times, we're at conferences meeting with as many people as we can. Now we're on Zoom and email meeting with as many people as we can. What I love about this job is that I do spend every day meeting with scientists talking about their work, and I love that. So I really do want to hear from scientists at any stage of the process if they want to talk about their work. If there's any way I can help them, even before, you know, often it's very far before they're ready to write up a manuscript, but they'll call me just to chat about their research, get some ideas about what directions they should take, because you know, we have a broad perspective, we have broader network and connections, we might have some ideas for develop the work or what the journal might be interested in or how they, they should approach a question. 
things they should look out for in something, uh, you know, like data access, how to approach that. So we're really here and we can be helpful resources to help guide your research and help guide you through publication process. And we do understand how tough the publication process is. I know I feel for everyone about how tough that's become. We want to help provide a good service. We want to help you through this. So do reach out and engage with your editor. Wow. And there you have it. Our mentors have spoken and reach out. You know, they are there for you. They're there to talk to you. Be confident, have healthy disrespect. Uh, and yeah, it will change your lives. So I think uh, this has been a great session. So we've reached the end of our discussion. Uh, it's been wonderful, really wonderful to have you on our show today. And thank you very much for these interesting discussions and giving us, you know, all these tips for our audiences and also a chance to learn about how researchers can approach publishing and how they, how the publishing world works. You know, it was, I think it's just, a, you know, just the, on the top surface, I'm sure there's a whole lot more, but it was just really interesting to know a little bit more about how the publishing world works. Could you please share with our listeners where we can find you on Twitter or LinkedIn or other social media outlets? We'll start with Orly. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is obacall and on LinkedIn as well. Anseh? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I'm, I'm there very, very often. Um, my handle there is at Sheyabimbala, my food name. And I'm also on LinkedIn, but I'm hardly over there. My name there is also Sheyabimbala. Thank you. And for our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Please follow us on Twitter at mentor underscore podcast, where we'll let you know when new episodes are released. Uh, you can listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud just by searching for Your Digital Mentor Podcast. You can also reach us by email. Uh, so please send your comments and questions to inquiries at yourdigimentor.net. And as always, uh, information on the episode and how to reach us will be on the description box, including how to connect with our guests and also links to more information and resources. And finally, our goal is for this podcast to be shared as a resource. So please remember to tell people about us. So thanks once again. And, and see, see you in two weeks. weeks. This episode is supported by Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences, a program which develops and delivers training and conferences that span basic research, cutting edge biomedicine and application of genomics in healthcare. Through engaging and networking, the events educate, inspire and transform careers worldwide. This episode is also supported by the Wellcome Sanger Institute. It undertakes large-scale research that forms the foundations of knowledge in biology and medicine. It uses the power of genome sequencing to understand and harness the information in DNA. The Sanger's discoveries are used to improve health and to understand life on Earth.